Yes, it is. Okay, so let's get started. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Caitlin O'Brien. I'm the events coordinator at Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi, a family of independent bookstores established in 1979 on the historic square in Oxford. Um, we are gathered here today to <laughs> celebrate uh, the publication of Morgan Thomas's collection of short stories, many where. Um, there are frankly too many fantastic blurbs to mention. So I thought maybe I'd just talk about um, all the lists that it appeared on for most anticipated. Um, so it was most anticipated book of 2022 by Nylon, Autostraddle, Electric Literature, Lambda Literary, The Millions, and Lit Hub. Not too shabby for a debut um, and, and well deserved. Um, so it's nine stories featuring lush and uncompromising uh, stories about characters crossing geographical borders and gender binaries. Um, we are so, so excited to have both Morgan and our conversation partner, Don Teal W. Moniz. Um, Morgan's gonna kick us off with a reading, but first I'd like to tell you a little more about the folks on our screen this evening. Um, Morgan Thomas's work has appeared in The Atlantic, The Kenyan Review, American Short Fiction, Vice, Electric Literature, Plowshares, Them, and Story Quarterly, where their story won the 2019 Fiction Prize. They're the recipient of a Breadloaf Work Study Grant, a Fulbright Grant, the Penny Wilkes Scholarship in Writing in the Environment, and the winner of the inaugural Southern Studies Fellowship in Arts and Letters. They have also received fellowships from Swanee's Writers Conference and the Arctic Circle. A graduate of the University of Oregon MFA program, they live in Portland. Don Teal W. Moniz uh, is the author of the Square Books bestselling Milk, Blood, Heat. Uh, she is a recipient of the Alice Hoffman Prize for Fiction, the Cecilia Joyce Johnson Emerging Writer Award by the Key West Literary Seminars, and a Tin House Scholarship. Her fiction has appeared or is forthcoming in the Paris Review, Tin House, Plowshares, the Yale Review, Joyland, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern and elsewhere. Moniz is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where she teaches fiction. She lives in Northeast Florida. Phew, um, two very accomplished and um, wonderful writers here this evening. We're all in for a treat. Um, those of y'all joining us on Zoom, please feel free to submit any questions you may have in the Q&A and I will come back and moderate those later in the evening. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna get out of here so Morgan can uh, read and then Don Teal will hop in and um, I think treat us to a really um, engaging conversation. Thank you all both so much for joining us. And um, I'm so, so looking forward to your conversation. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Uh, it's really lovely to be hosted by Square Books. Uh, it's the first like, bookstore in the South that I've had the honor of being hosted by. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I also just wanna say thank you, Don Teal, for taking the time to speak with me. Uh, I recently was revisiting Milk Blood Heat and I'm just so enamored with those stories and with your writing in general. So it's an incredible honor to spend an hour with you. Uh, and I have a very short five minute reading to uh, kick us off. This is the beginning of the title story, Manywhere. My father walks circles around my kitchen. After 20 laps, he pauses to chart his progress on a road atlas lying open beside the sink, mile by mile. He wears off-trail boots, the laces double knotted over knee socks. His calves above his socks are bare, smooth as well-oiled pistons. Hey, dad, where are you walking? He's been walking so long, he's worn through the laminate to the floorboards. From the sofa where I write this, I can see the polished boards, the places where he's dusted the floor just by shuffling across it. Hey, dad, aren't you there yet? Last time I checked his atlas, he was on the long trail north of Ethan's Gap, his progress charted by a trembling black line. That was days ago. By now, I guess he's well into Quebec. He's crossed the St. Lawrence, paused to cool his blistered feet in the river. From the bend in his back, the heel heavy clomp of his boots, I bet he's walking uphill. When I stand at the stove to fry gritty bread, he brushes past me without a word. 
as if I'm a tree or a fence post or an outcropping of rock encroaching on his trail. I'm the child he didn't choose, born to a woman he wasn't planning to marry in the summer of 1992. That year, he walked the picket line, paced the pavement outside Paradise Hotel and Casino. My mother walked with him. When they broke for lunch, he taped her feet, taped across the top of her toes to prevent fall blisters, layered her hot spots with benzoin and petroleum jelly, bathed every sore with a sponge dipped not in water, which would sting the open skin, but in skin milk pasteurized. This is the memory my mother offered when, as a child, I asked about romance. She offered it as proof of his love, but he taped the feet of everyone who walked the line. They called him moleskin because he always had it handy. My mother got big with me. She got tired. She got a job at Vintage Pizza, which sat right across from the casino. Her wages paid the bills while he walked. When I was an infant, she kept me strapped in a car seat in the utility closet. When the front was slow, she sat on an upturned bleach bucket and nursed me or pumped. She kept one eye always on the picket line where he paced back and forth. She knew once a man starts walking, it's hard to stop him. They didn't last. When I was four, my mother walked out on her and my, my father walked out on her and my mother moved in with her sister, took me along. For years, I didn't see him, we didn't speak. During those years, my father reinvented me. He made me in his image, which is to say he made me walking, a walking daughter, one who would follow him. He's told me about her, his walking daughter, as he rings my kitchen island told me she went to the University of Alabama on a soccer scholarship, led backpacking trips in the summer, studied accounting, married in her third year, never finished her fourth. Now she has a kid and a job at the cutting table at Joanne's, sliding a pair of snips at the sheer guide for minimum wage. That's not true, I say to him, that's not real. I say this every time he brings her up. It's important to me, keeping him in check, letting him know when he's gone off into delusion or dream. I don't resent his invention of her, but I resent the life he created for her, for me, a life with no room for choice. He showed me photos to prove she exists, photos of myself from three years back when I looked like a woman, photos I can't stand to look at and certainly don't remember sharing with him. In them, I'm grinning with a toddler in my arms. Isn't that your cousin's kid, I ask him, but he insists it's hers. I'm posing in front of an Oaks cross section with a man I'd never choose, thick-limbed and unsmiling, a military haircut. Is that my old coworker, I ask? Her husband, my father says. She's not real, I tell him. But part of me always believed in her or wanted to believe. I waited for her like a banana spider hung between two leaves. I kept a full set of my old clothes for her. I kept beer and cigarettes in the cabinet above the fridge because he said those were her go-tos. I prepared to hand him off to her. I'd been living six months with my father. It was her turn. I used to wonder if I'd seen her, body surfing in the bay, buying scallops at the public seafood counter. I once bummed a cigarette and a maxi pad off someone in a CVS parking lot who might have been her. Then, three days ago, I met her. I saw her sitting at the bar inside Sandshaker, a backpack leaning against her stool. She was sipping a margarita through a straw. I slid in. I bought her a drink. She said, I'm married. I said, I know. We looked similar, same eyes, same pebbling of acne scars on her jaw. She didn't mention this, so neither did I. I didn't ask about the specifics of her life. I had no desire to hear them confirmed. Instead, I asked, did you walk here? I'll stop there. Hi. Hello. Um, hi, I'm so excited to be here with you, Morgan. Um, and we're gonna get started in just a bit with, I have lots of questions. I wanna remind everybody, please don't feel shy. If you have questions, please do drop them in the chat. We will be happy to answer those questions um, near the end. But first, I just wanted to say that, um, so Morgan and I share an agent. And so I had the benefit of uh, reading these stories sometime like in the middle of last year. Um, you know, our agent, you know, emailed me and was like, hey, I, I'm going to send you some stories. I think you're going to love them. And, you know, and they got here and I was like, I don't have a critic's language and I'm not really interested in cultivating that, but I got to the, you know, <laughs> I would get to the end of some of these stories and I'd be like, well, fuck. And I was like, and for me, that's like the biggest compliment that you, you know, just the resonance of how the language situated itself in my body. So really, Morgan, I just wanted to say congratulations. This is a gorgeous and fully realized collection. I'm so honored to be talking about it with you. Um, so to, to get started then, my first question, because I'm always curious, especially with story writers, right? I feel like we, when we're constructing stories, it's so different from a novel because 
half the time you don't even know that you might be writing a story collection, right? Because, you know, there might be so much difference or time or whatever between the time you're telling these stories and the time you realize that they're connected. So I guess my two part kind of question is, when did you know you had a collection? Just because I'm always curious about that. And how far apart was the writing of each of these stories? Mm, yeah. Um, so I had written three of the stories, um, Taylor Johnson's Lightning Man, The Expectation of Cooper's Hill, and Alta's Place, when I realized that the three of them were interested in the same phenomenon of uh, self-mythology based on another person, whether that's a historical figure or a contemporary um, like individual that, that the character is interacting with. And that all they were also all asking questions about uh, gender and sexuality, uh, lineage, legacy, and whiteness. And so I understood them to be in conversation with each other and became interested in expanding those questions within other stories within a collection. So I think that's when the, the seed of the collection itself really came to be. And then these stories are written over a period of I think about four years with wow. the exception of um, transit being an outlier. That was a, a story that I wrote well before I began to think of the collection, well before I had written those three stories and returned to it at the end. And actually with the help of our wonderful agent, uh, revised it and understood when I returned to it that there were a lot of pieces of gender queer identity and, and of queerness that were sort of sublimated in the earliest draft of that story that needed just a little bit of revision to bring them up to the surface, which I think just goes to show that my writing is almost always out ahead of me when it comes to my own understandings of myself and my identities. I feel like that's true for most writers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What we do, if you're called to writing or writing life, so much of it is like intuitive based or unconscious to you. You're just doing it. Like that's just the way you move or the way you think. And then it's like laying it all out and either you looking at it at some distance or having somebody with a great eye, right, to come in and be like, hey, I see what you're doing here. Here are the things you're kind of circling. You've always been circling and how can we make them um, more in connection or whatever. So, yeah, um, thank you for sharing that. That for me is just I'm always like, how does that work? You know, like how does a story become a collection, a single story branch out into this larger book? Um, so I want to talk about the Lightning Man, or the Lightning Man story for me because I was so struck by that as a first story. You know, it's exploring all of these themes. There's tenderness. There's control. Lack of control. It's you know, there's so much searching in all of these stories. But like, but this is the the first landing place of the collection, right? Um, there's also the desire to be seen for exactly who you are and for that self to be beautiful, to be to be totally fine the way that that it's being seen, and so. I was especially taken with all of those things, but I think also with the concept of the lightning man. Um, and so my first thought when I came to that term was like, oh, lightning in a bottle, you know, something electric, mm. something unrepeatable, something absolutely unique. And so I'm wondering, this is a three-part question and I can totally repeat <laughs> something if, if you need me to. So first, how did this character come to you? Two, I was really interested in both the main character and their mother's like separate, but very important and distinct relationship to the Lightning Man. And I wondered how you conceive of that difference and how they're deriving importance. And then third, how did you decide on this story as the first story, as the, you know, the reception hall of your collection? Mm -hmm. um, great. Uh, first, just thank you for those words, especially about um, being seen and, and being beautiful in the way that one is seen. I think that that is a really generous reading. Um, and then, so, uh, so, so a friend told me about Frank Woodhull, who is um, the historical figure on which that story is based and which inspired it. And I found myself really interested in Woodhull's story, uh, fascinated by Frank Woodhull, feeling the sense of kinship with Frank Woodhull that I couldn't fully uh, like explain to myself and that I was also skeptical of because Frank Woodhull lived in 1908 and I have no way of knowing how Frank Woodhull thought about gender. And so I was like, am I putting, like, am I imposing this understanding of gender on this historical figure in order to find some sort of model for myself? So I was in a like just a rabbit hole of research um, and ended up being interested in that actual phenomenon of research and obsession and fascination with this character, which is where the sort of structure of the story came from. But then there was just a, a piece of uh, a New York Times interview with Frank Woodhull. There were lots of like interviews historically um, in which Woodhull talked about 
selling all sorts of different things, uh, books and lightning rods. And so that that intrigued me. Uh, and I was uh, I became interested in this like conception of selling a lightning rod as like uh, preventative implement that's meant to like forego disaster, right? And especially in a space like the Gulf Coast where it feels like disaster just feels sort of ever present in the form of hurricanes and other um, natural forces and then also like like human generated uh, disasters and inequities. And so I, was, I became interested in just that, that symbol itself. Uh, and then there was another tiny bit of an interview uh, in which the in which Frank Woodhull said I'm planning to go to New Orleans where there are opportunities for employment and I don't know if Frank Woodhull actually went to New Orleans but as a person who grew up again on the Gulf Coast in Northwest Florida and who has family in Louisiana and in New Orleans I was looking still for this connection to southernness right um, and so even though Frank Woodhull is a uh, like Canadian by birth and lived in many different places I was really interested in that in imagining through story the piece of their life that would have happened in uh like in new orleans in the south in louisiana this landscape that felt really familiar to me and really charged um and then that is just the first of your three questions so yes. i will ask you to repeat the second <laughs> yeah the, the second one was that i was so interested in that the main character and the mother character both mm -hmm. had this relationship that seemed really important or the way that they were conceiving of the lightning man, but it was very different, right? And so I was wondering how you were conceiving of what's the difference between their relationship to the lightning man? Um, yeah, what's the importance that they're both deriving separately? Yeah, so I think this to me is one of the things that the collection is interested in, which is the sense of like inherited stories and inherited concepts and understandings, and especially I think inherited understandings of gender and gender identity. Uh, so like the mother is seeing in Frank Woodhull, this individual who was really highly circumscribed by, by gender expression in 1908 in a way that maybe the mother is not feeling circumscribed by um, gender expression and by womanhood in the 21st century. And then the narrator is feeling sort of circumscribed by understandings of gender in the 21st century and so is therefore inscribing a different uh, sort of like inspiration or kinship with Frank Woodhull. Uh, and I think what is interesting to me about those two stories is that I think like as a genderqueer person in the 21st century, um, I like, I'm, there's no way for me to say like, this is the right and this is like the wrong way of thinking about Frank Woodhull writer of, of understanding this story. And so I'm interested in the idea that there's actually space on the page for those two understandings and those two interpretations and those two senses and sources of kinship to coexist yeah. um, between like mother and child there. Yeah, and I think that speaks to overall what we're getting at is that like the nuances of even, you know, exploring and expressing gender in and of itself is this thing that's, you know what I mean, is is neither nor as none of these spectrums are adhered to any binaries, right? Or like a lot of this is unshackling or destroying whatever we have a sense of those binaries for. So yeah, that makes sense to me. And I think it echoes in like all of these stories as a whole arc. Um, and then the third one was just, um, how did you decide on this story as the first landing place for your collection? Yeah, I mean, in part, just I think because that was where the, the thought of this collection sort of sprung from. Um, and also because I think that to me, the questions of gender specifically and gender identity felt maybe clearest and also uh, most concise in that story. And then I think the other stories sort of felt sprawling by comparison or like they were under, they were um, uh, exploring nuances of gendered identities that the first story just like encapsulated very cleanly. So I think of it as a sort of thesis statement that then like the other stories can riff off of or can expand upon or can imagine new possibilities for. Um, and I think also to what you were saying uh, just a moment ago about like those two coexisting narratives um, is something that like the that moment where the mother says that uh, like woman is infinite that it can be anything I think it's something it gets it from a conversation that I had with my mother um, and I I just remember understanding like like that that is true right that, that I also understand that to be true and that I also understand myself to be outside of it and finding myself in this space where I didn't know actually like how to articulate that um, in that moment and I think the narrator also isn't sure how to articulate it and I'm still not sure how to articulate it. I think of like the poem Dysphoria by Oliver Bendorf, where I think he says, yeah. uh, like where they say, and as for gender, I can't describe it any more than a poem. Um, yeah, there was an instinct I followed it, a song about little bird tracks in the snow. 
Huh. Yeah, I love that. And I love Oliver. So I'm glad that you um, invoked him in this conversation too. That's great. Um, so you, you touched on this a little bit in talking about um, this, this second question I just asked you, but you know, New Orleans in the South is just gritty on these pages, right? Just dripping, heated, very visceral or words I think of. And I feel like, and you know, I just did my book tour last year. And so this is something that I heard a lot, but I feel like often in literary spaces, we talk about um, places, a character in a story, but so much so that now I think the phrase is starting to lose a little bit of its specificity. You know what I mean? It almost, <laughs> not that it doesn't mean anything, but it almost is like a losing a little bit of its sheen. Um, and so instead, I want to talk about place as a catalyst, right? Something that's mm-hmm. reacting on the characters and something where, you know, the, the environment is reacting back largely in response to the way the characters are reacting on it, right? Um, you've got a lot in here that has to do with natural landscapes and and climate disaster and you know just all like you said the impendingness of some sort of catastrophe is kind of always um, in the atmosphere and so one of the lines that struck me um in the collection was from it's uh i think it was from that drowning place is you can't hide from the water forever um you know and florida appears in these stories as well and as someone from there i really felt that line in my body and so I wanted to know how did place and climate uh, manifest as a critical element of these stories for you? What were you hoping to get at? What do you feel is the urgency of the relationship between people and place? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think this is a space where I feel like I have way more questions than answers. Um, I know when I was thinking about that drowning place, I was, there are two questions that were in my mind that I think are still in my mind. And one was, like what does it look like to substitute sort of psychological realism, which was a a sort of catchphrase in my MFA that I think people talked about a lot, like trying to think about how to get inside the head of a character. What does it mean to actually substitute that with like ecological realism and to think about actually forefronting instead landscape and relationships, like thinking of ecology as relationships between people, between people and their environment, between uh, like non-human animals and and humans and their environments. Uh, So what does it look like for that to actually be uh, centered in a story? Um, And then I think the other thing that felt of a piece with that uh, was, again, like I feel like in my MFA we talked about character-driven fiction and I was like, what would it actually mean to think about like place-driven fiction? Mm -hmm. Um, So when you're thinking about place as a catalyst, yeah, what does it mean to actually think about uh, like the plot and the story and the drama that exists within landscape? And there's so much there. I think there's so much richness there. And I don't, I think these are things that I'm still these are still questions. Like, what do those things look like? Those are still questions for me. I don't, I don't think the stories of many where I feel like they've answered that at least not fully. Those are things I'm still exploring, but for instance, in that drowning place, like the structure of the story of that story to me uh, came from my thinking about like flood and accumulation and the, like the, the way that those details just create a sort of mass through the collective voice came from the ways that uh, like, the images that I've seen and the landscapes that I've experienced after disasters and hurricanes and this inundation that happens and that remains in the landscape, um, what is left behind. And so I think those are some of the ways that I started to think about how place could function in a story. And I am really interested in expanding it beyond the sort of places character uh, saying, which seems to me like it still is privileging centrally like character uh, in a story. And I'm interested in, in not privileging character in a story. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think, you know, I, I, think, I think I've been feeling that way about the places character phrase, but it was when I was reading your collection over these last um, few days, you know, to re, re-enter these stories for our talk that I really was like, oh, no, 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 this is different. This is different than character. This is catalyst. This is reaction. And you know what I mean? Action and reaction, right? It's not just oh, the environment is, you know, made this way and it does what it does. It's we have affected things in such a way that this is the consequence of, do you know what I mean? So like yeah. level of intensity of this, um, of these forces of nature, I think. And I think too, I was thinking a lot about not just flooding, but sinking, right? Like I'm thinking mm-hmm. about how New Orleans and Florida are already kind of below sea level, like literally. And so like what the, what that does when water rises, um, you know, there was a lot of like, mold imagery and dance imagery yeah. and just like you know things hanging around waiting to bloom and not necessarily for the benefit of these characters right but like in consequence of the characters so um yeah that was really interesting to me um so 
again, this is something that you've talked about because again, it's omnipresent in your, in your collection, but your collection is alive with history, right? So many things that are true or assumed to be true, right? Like there, there are ways in which um, we can't exactly know that these are facts. And so that's where the fiction part of it comes in. But I think too, what was striking to me is that most of these histories are the kinds that are not recorded purposely, right? So that they'll be forgotten. And I'm talking here obviously about um, trans and queer stories, as well as the stories of black folks and women specifically who are often marginalized in histories that they contributed largely to. I'm thinking about um, your story with like the midwives, the black midwives and this kind of thing. And, and you know, the consequences of um, wanting to run those people out of their own territories. So I think, mm -hmm. My first, so this is a two part question. Uh, the first is in the midst of fiction, how did you come to fact or how did you become interested and drawn to that element? I loved your, um, the notes page in the back which I think is really rare for fiction. I haven't seen many fiction like <laughs> things that I've read that's like, oh, but here's, you know, here are all the sources. And then um, I wanna ask you, can you talk about what drew you to honor the lost or ignored or biased histories in your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um... In terms of coming to fact within stories of fiction, I think that I often began there. Uh, and it was a way often actually of overcoming a sort of writer's block or like a, an uncertainty of what story uh, I was interested in writing next to just enter into the archives and chase in a pretty chaotic way, uh, like bits of, of interesting fact or, uh, yeah, or like an interesting quote or a quotation. I remember finding the transcript of Thomasine Hall um, from 1629 that inspired the daring life of Philippa Cook the Rogue. And just seeing in this like archive, these court records, this person stand up 400 years ago and say like, I am both a man and a woman and then talk openly about uh, sexuality and like queer sexuality. And I feel like I, I was completely astonished and felt this spark of, of joy and, uh, and kinship. And so I think often the story is actually built from there and fiction was what came in in later drafts. Um, and the first drafts were often like held more closely to fact, but then I came up against, I think the second part of your question, the fact that often there was very little fact to draw on. And if I wanted to stay true to the facts, then my ability to actually tell this story or to actually imagine the life of this person to actually bring them to life on the page was really circumscribed. And I also felt like often the way that they were told in a sort of non-fictional accounts, uh, like didn't always feel true to me to their lived experience, right? Like people talking about um, Frank Woodhull, for instance, as being like a woman who was like passing as a man for certain reasons. And I don't know how Frank Woodhull thought about gender, but I didn't feel comfortable accepting that understanding from like nonfiction books about that person. And so the fiction came in through multiple drafts uh, as I was trying to think through these things and think about how best to actually uh, animate these people um, on the page. And uh, repeat your second question. Yeah, I know I'm getting so, to it. No, yeah. And so the second part of that, right, is I was, I was really struck by um, how you handled black history and stories and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing and honoring the fact that again these people are have been so marginalized in history that they were main components of and so how you came to um to honor that as well in particular thinking of the story um that's going through midwifery yeah. and that change yeah um so there i think what i felt was centrally that uh that i could not look away from the complex ways in which every single white settler that I found who was queer or genderqueer in history was also complicit in projects of settler colonization and slavery and uh, like racial inequities. And that was true no matter where in history I was looking. Um, and so it felt like it would be just a fundamentally unethical choice to look away from that and to only portray one aspect of these individuals lives right um to sort of like heroize them in this way that was like flattening and untrue and so i wanted to portray like complexity within their lives and to understand these individuals as people who were marginalized on certain axes and also privileged on other axes right the fact that frank woodhull was a protestant and masculine presenting and white uh I did a lot, I think, for that person on a, in Ellis Island, right? And so those are things that are important to also being, uh, bring to the page. And so I think that when I'm thinking 
for instance, about the expectation of Cooper Hill, I was uh, just wanting to ensure that I uh, looked directly at that history of um, like white gynecologists driving black midwives out of their profession because they saw them as professional competition and right. the way that this individual, um, this queer, possibly gender queer individual, uh, like used that, right? Like used that racist structure um, as a way to try to maintain her own professional footholds. Uh, and so to understand her as that complex person, um, yeah, it was important to me. Yeah, I think oftentimes the most, you know, love that we can show for characters and for people is to be entirely honest about who they are. Um, mm -hmm. Same with places, right? Um, you know what I mean? There's something, like you said, flattening and, and limiting about like not acknowledging a fullness of a person, whether that thing that you're acknowledging is deemed negative or positive or whatever it is. And so, yeah, I, I felt that in these characters. None of these characters felt like tropes. None of them felt flat. They all felt like fully human, you know, like and I'm thinking about, and I don't want to I don't know if it's giving things away. I mean, I, I don't really <laughs> believe spoilers because it's like, you should oh, say it. Like the thing about, but <laughs> I'm thinking about, um, I'm so terrible with titles. I remember everything that happens, in the next <laughs> title, but it's the, it's the story where the, the couple is at the movie theater and it's on fire. And oh yeah, so good. You know, and they're telling, you know, she's telling the story to the group of other sur surrogates. And then it turns out that, you know, they left her in this trunk you know everybody's aghast about it but then you know she goes back and she's thinking over in her memory about it and her partner is kind of like oh no no no, we definitely called somebody even though she knows that they did and I don't know I'm just saying the ambiguity of morality is so like important and full in this book and I really appreciated it um so to that end I think there's so much searching in this collection right there's hunger thirst desire possibility and impossibility of like yearning something already set in stone like and I, I'm, and I'm thinking in particular here like um with uh the the date with Fred Woodhall and the and Philippa it's like oh I'm meeting this person in history but this person is already long gone so it's like imagining a future time to meet a person that you can never actually meet um and I'm also thinking of the story transit and and that part of that last line which is though I know a stone can't do a thing with a lily you know what I mean and so there's a fixedness tier or a determined quality to some of these paths. But at the same time, there's also so much mutability. And in that way, hope is what I was getting. Like these stories were still hopeful um, to me. So I wondered if you can speak a bit more on this or how, or if you see this theme in your work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's making me think of, um, which wasn't one of the stories that you mentioned, but I think, I think what I'm seeing in many of the stories uh, is the sense that like yearning and searching often lead to these moments of joy or of fulfillment, which are also ephemeral and usually pretty short, right? So characters will often sort of come to, to actually have some sort of grasp on a desire um, or to live in a sort of affirmed experience that they've been seeking, but then they come up always against, uh, I mean, I think against the world and the way that the world continues to circumscribe them. So I'm thinking about Louis, right? Who is wearing this pregnancy bump and really like living out this experience that she's wanted and there's joy in that and there's hope in that. And I think there's a lot of joy in that story. I was thinking a lot about joy as I wrote that story. Uh, and yet at the end of the story, we see her come up again against uh, like the the way in which she's seen by her nana and her partner and the transphobic narratives that they still have and the way that they're still unable to sort of enter into uh, Louis's lived experience in the way that Louis needs them to. And I think, I mean, I think for me at the end of that story, I'm just like, the world doesn't deserve Louis yet, I don't think, um, or like the world's not ready for Louis yet. Uh, and that the trouble isn't, right, Louis's desires or the way that Louis acts on them, the trouble is, is the world that's unable to see them as um, valid and real. And so I think for all of these narrators, there's a searching that often offers some, some resolution, some joy, but then eventually is circumscribed still by, by the world in which we live. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. All things are temporary. All things change. That's the one constant of our universe is that things change. Nothing is yeah. forever. And so it's like, that's with, you know, sadnesses as well as joys. And I think that that's really present. Like I said, I think sometimes people like to like put story collections like ours in little boxes when it's when it's trying to like um, explore real territories as oh these are dark or oh these are you know sad stories or whatever and it's like no it's, it's all things because it's 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 trying to get at the fullness of 
um, what it means to be a human and living in a body and especially a body that might not feel like your body. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like at, yeah. all, at all times. So, and I'm glad you bring up Louis because that, that brings up my next question, which is like one of my favorite things to ask. I, and I suppose it's because it's always on my mind. I keep an eye out for um, mother narratives, mm-hmm. um, you know, what that journey means for both parent and child what it means in the world we live in and what it means for bodies that weren't designed for it as well as those that were. And you have a lot of those themes running through many of these stories, right? Even if it wasn't like explicit, it felt like it was still there. And so I wondered, um, were these narratives ones that you intended to seek in this collection or did it surprise you the way it showed up in the work? Mm, Yes. Uh, Yeah, I was just, again, like returned to Milk Blood Heat in the last few days and was again struck by um, how beautifully you also are writing about motherhood and the bodies and the connections between like motherhood and womanhood and those constructions. Um, And I think for me, I was surprised by that theme in the book. It, uh, It was not intentional on my part. However, I think in retrospect, it makes sense because so many of our constructions of gender are really closely tied, right, with ideas about procreation and children and who has children and who doesn't have children, who raises children and and these family structures that can be incredibly limiting, whether you are a cis person or not, um, like or a trans or gender queer person, I think that they limit all of us in different ways. And so it makes sense to me, looking back on the story, that those themes are really present because the, the collection is attempting to ask uh, about how we might be able to push on or to reconsider some of the ways that we're thinking about gender, which also inherently asks us, I think, to reconsider the ways that we're thinking about childbirth and motherhood. Yeah, and parenthood. And yeah. Down. Yeah, and I'm, I'm 100% with you. I did not know that I was writing about motherhood, <laughs> motherhood or procreation or any of that stuff. I was like, I'm writing about morality and you know and then it was like oh I'm writing about did I have babies is that a thing (laughs) in this world you know what I mean and so yeah I think it's really interesting the things that again that unconscious ability to be circling around whatever your questions are um so I have I have one more question officially but like I, I can have other questions so just a reminder that if you have a question please drop them in the chat I see one in there um but so my last official question for you is um when people leave these worlds that you created what do you want them to consider and what do you want them to take away from these worlds Mm, yeah I think just considering the the people and the stories on whom or on which our self-mythologies are based and constructed Uh, and also looking at the gaps in those narratives of ourselves uh, and how we might reconsider them, how we might reconsider uh, like our histories to be more inclusive and our own understandings of ourselves to be um, like, just to better understand the the people that we're accountable to and the the sources of those narratives. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Morgan. Thank you. Uh, I it's pleasure talking to you about this book I mean really so gorgeously realized like the sent on the sentence level immaculate like you know and I'm a, I'm a sentences girl myself so like I'm, I'm always like Ooh, sentences singing so yes please um ask questions yay and then back yeah. to you Caitlin <laughs> hi uh thank you both so much and um oh and, and thank you to our audience for being so um warm and um like me, I've so enjoyed this conversation. So right now we have one question. Um, Wait, I'm so sorry. Meredith is here. Hi, Meredith. <laughs> sorry. sorry. All good. No. Um, and so uh, don't be shy. Phil, do you have questions? Um, if not, I, I have one. Um, so anyway, but uh, uh, Roby asks, um, how did you learn about or come up with the character of Philippa Cook? Yeah, so that story is inspired by uh, the historical figure Thomasine Hall, which I think I saw you drop in the chat earlier, Caitlin. Um, And uh, I found a transcript of a a court trial uh, from Thomasine Hall where they talked about um, gender and described, uh, Thomasine Hall described gender for themselves as being both a man and a woman. And I was really interested in what that would have meant in 1629 um, and continued to research and then write the story of like a cook based on it, uh, shifting things and really creating a different uh, 
character in that story because I under, I wanted to be able to write into those historical gaps without uh, like do, imposing any sort of personal understandings on Thomasine Hall in that specific history. Thank you. Um, and I've got one while uh, maybe folks kind of gather the courage to, to ask one themselves if, if you do have one and that's something you're feeling. Um, so, and like, this is kind of a, a cheesy question that I've asked uh, other folks before, but um, I always love the answers and I'd love for, for either of y'all to answer this if you would like to. Um, so you're like having a, a literary dinner party and so you have, um, you invite kind of one, one hero, whatever that means to you, and then one um, kind of a contemporary or up and comer that you think, um, you know, not enough people are reading. Um, who who are you taking to the table? Kind of a hard question, but um, we always get such great names from it. Man, um, let's see. <laughs> I don't know if I can choose one literary hero, but I think a book that I read a few months ago and found really incredible was um, Billy Ray Belcourt's mem uh, memoir, A History of My Brief Body. And so I'm thinking about that person. And then also a book that I had the pleasure of reading uh, early and that comes out in the spring is uh, Riss Nielsen's Deep in Providence, which is a really incredible oh YA God. novel. Yes, Chantel, you yes. know this too. Yes. <laughs> um, so that is an, an up and coming book that I uh, am really excited about and think everyone should read. Everyone read it. Yeah. One more time, give us the author. Um, Riss Nielsen. Mm -hmm. And that the title, sorry, I'm just a slow typer. You're fine, Deep in Providence. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Don Teal, care to answer? And these aren't set in stone. Oh, this is in this oh I wasn't prepared. I was like, <laughs> we're gonna heat You don't have to. <laughs> I just like. Um, yeah, can I ask a question instead? I'm so yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question to ask that I didn't get to ask, um, which is, sorry for the cop out. Um, no. So there were, th there were times where disordered eating came up like a few times you know like this desire for for thinness almost like a desire to disappear but to me it didn't really feel quite like mm -hmm. oh I want to disappear it was like I need control over at least this space in a world where so much is out of my hands and so I wonder if you can um, talk a little bit about how you felt about that that theme kind of coming up in the work Mm, yeah, I love that question. I think it gets at embodiment and how difficult uh, embodiment is for so many of these characters um, and how difficult it can be for me as a person. And I think that uh, one of the things that I know now that I didn't know like when I was writing Transit where I think the disordered eating is sort of more, most central um, is that often there are uh, correlations between gender queer identities and trans identities and um, struggles with like eating disorders. And I think that in part that has to do with the fact that our perceptions of gender are uh, like strangely physical, right? Or like based on assumptions about what bodies look like and that like if there's a way to control that or a way to like create a sort of androgyny through slimness, then that can feel affirming. Um, and I think also it has to do with Dante with what you were saying about um, about control more generally and about the way that like so many assumptions and uh, are made about our bodies and about who we are based on our bodies and a desire to try to control those things. Um, and so I think those are the different ways that I'm seeing it work on the page and in the stories. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me too. Thinness on the one hand, but then also like stopping biological functions too, right? It's like, oh, yeah. if I'm this thin, I won't have my period, which means I'm not yeah. a woman. I, so, and that's how I'm controlling that, that area of my, of my body. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that was, I think that was the only question that I didn't really get to say. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this has been um, really a, a treat. Um, I always like say this again and again, but it's because um, I mean it. Uh, I'm so grateful that y'all have taken the time to um, 
both kind of uh, write these books and put them into the world and uh, take an hour of your um, busy lives to, to discuss them with us. Um, it really is uh, such a treat and, and a, an honor to host, um, especially when there's still so many obstacles to our coming together. And this is like, uh, I don't, I mean, it's cheesy, but it's true. It's like a real salve. And I'm just um, so glad that y'all could do this today. Um, so I do want to remind folks at home, I've dropped it in the chat just a couple of times. Um, I have signed book, pl well, sorry. Yeah. Signed book plate editions of both of these um, wonderful books are, these book plates are in the mail, but they're coming and I will hold the book for you. And they are coming. Me. Yeah, um, that was my bad, <laughs> um, but they'll be here shortly. And uh, I would like to also gently remind folks that we can't have author events, virtual, hybrid, in person or whatever else we dream up next without your support. So if you don't already have um, Manywhere or Milk Blood Heat, I would love to sell it to you. You can uh, buy it at squarebooks.com or give us a call or, or just come see us. All that information is on our website and uh, I will send you all an email with a little roundup and a recording of this event if you would like to return yeah. to it. Please buy from the bookstores. We want them to be around for many, 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 many futures. So please yes. buy, even if you don't buy our books, buy something from the bookstore, yeah. please. <laughs> There's no robots, no algorithms, no billionaires. It's it's a wonderful place. And we would um, love to help you out, whether that's virtual, in person, or however you would like to be in touch is just fine with us. And um, yeah, but thank you both so much. Um, do y'all like to say anything else? It's hard to wrap these up. It's always a little awkward. Just thank you uh, so much for hosting me. And Antil, thank you so much for the wonderful questions. It's been a real pleasure to have a conversation with you. Yes, thanks for the honor of being in conversation with you. And thank you for, to Square Books for hosting us. And thanks for everybody who's in the audience and who's yes. there. Listening. Appreciate it. That's true. Yeah, thank you all. It's just a big old love fest. I hope to do this again soon. And congrats to you both. And uh, in the meantime, take care. I'm going to push the big red button and end this. Okay. Bye. Bye.